to the press conference this afternoon. The President of the ECB will make a few introductory remarks and comments, and then we'll take your questions. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say a few words on uh, what uh, uh, we have discussed uh, during these meetings. Um, I gave a presentation of the situation of the Eurozone, and uh, I started from growth. And we see that growth is continuing at the steady but moderate pace. After the first quarter, when growth was 0.6%, the following quarter was 0.3%, and we expect the same pace for the rest of the year, where we see a 1.7 growth for this year, 1.6 for the year after. The uh, risks for growth are on the downside, and this was emphasized by the IMS presentation as well. Mostly geopolitical risks and a slowdown in world trade, but mostly geopolitical. The uh, economic outlook uh, has, uh, for the Eurozone has stabilized if we compare it with uh, the last, uh, sp the, the, if, if we compare it with the one we had during the last spring meetings. The uh, inflation prospects are of an inflation rate that remains low and subdued and then by year end, first month of next year, it should pick up and move towards 1% and later on above 1%, essentially due to base effects of the energy prices. Thereafter, the inflation rate would continue to increase to 1.6% for the year after and uh, towards our objective to be reached by the end of the forecast horizon 2018 or the beginning of the year after. The mechanic behind that is that the main driver is our monetary policy. And uh, as the recovery will continue, the output gap will close, wages, nominal wages will start rising, and thereafter we'll see inflation going towards a level of 2% below, but close to 2%. The um, Governing Council continues to monitor closely the possible presence of second round effects given produced by the fact that inflation has been so low for such a long time that could get ingrained in the wage negotiations. We have no firm evidence of anything like that at this point in time, but we continue monitoring the situation. Also briefly sketched some, uh, said some words about inflation expectations, where if we take the survey-based inflation expectations, they present a picture which is uh, more stable, more anchored, and more benign than market-based inflation expectations. But of course, when we look at market-based inflation expectations, we have to be aware that they also reflect underlying movement in movements in asset prices. And therefore, sometimes they may be a less than accurate representation of what the expectations are. I briefly presented the, uh, our monetary policy actions and the decisions that we have taken in March. I've said that we are completely focused on implementation. And uh, basically, let me read exactly the words of our last uh, press conference because they are quite uh, they are quite telling so what i said is that the project in the last press conference we had the macroeconomic projections of uh, the uh, growth and inflation for the for the for the for the, for, for the uh, forecasting horizon what i said is that the projected path of inflation remains conditional on exceptionally supportive financing conditions, which to a large extent reflect our accommodative monetary policy. So the projections are predicated on maintaining 
the exceptionally strong monetary support. Then I said, we will preserve the very substantial amount of monetary support that is embedded in our staff projections and that is necessary to secure a return of inflation to levels below but close to 2% over the medium term. So that's the objective, that's the action that we are undertaking. These are the projections that are based on such actions. Then I said, meanwhile, the Governing Council tasked the relevant committees to evaluate the options that ensure a smooth implementation of our purchase program so as to remove potential obstacles that our purchase programs might encounter. And then what is our program? Our program is intended to go until March or beyond if necessary. And it says exactly in any case until the Governing Council sees, sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. Thereafter, uh, thereafter, I briefly discussed the um, other, other features of our monetary policy. I elaborated on its effectiveness where there is one, I gave a few numbers. Uh, one is particularly telling. Uh, the lending rates have declined significantly since the start of asset purchase program. And one way to say how much they declined is that uh, it would have taken, under normal circumstances, it would have taken a reduction of 100 basis points in our policy rates to obtain the reduction that we have seen in the bank lending rates. Second, the spreads across firms between small, small and medium-sized uh, firms, SMEs, and large corporates, and between across countries have declined as well, basically eliminating all, what, all of, of what we called the redenomination re premium that we saw in 2012-2013. Our lending volumes also have grown considerably, and uh, from a minus 3% growth, so negative growth, negative growth month over month that we had seen in 2013, until 2013, we are now at around plus 2% month over month. So again, lending volumes continue to grow steadily, and they've been growing for more than two years now. The bottom line of this is basically that uh, fragmentation that has, um, was one of the main problems that we had to face is gone. There is no more fragmentation. Our monetary policy is well transmitted all across the euro area now. And then there are some interesting figures about uh, what is the country. We said interest rates have gone down, asset prices have moved, our monetary policy is transmitted all across the euro area, but how much is the contribution to growth of our monetary policy and to inflation? And there are some numbers that are estimates tell that uh, we had uh, a 1.3% additional growth cumulative over three years and 1.4% of inflation cumulative over three years. In other words, if our policy had not been undertaken, we would see inflation to be lower by 1.4% and growth 1.3%. Now, private sector estimates are also available, and they are quite more significant, quite bigger. I also remarked that this monetary policy does have side effects, of course. Low rates for a long time, very accommodative monetary policy, have side effects for banks, insurance companies, pension funds, savers, and uh, it might also have effects on financial stability. So we are monitoring the effects on financial stability. We're monitoring them very closely, but so far we have not seen 
anything that might be defined as a bubble. We may see some price increases, especially in the real estate sector, in uh, some localized contexts, like large cities, in some large cities, not all, some large cities we've seen real estate prices going up. But that's not what defines a bubble. You also need a significant increase in leverage. And we don't see that. As a matter of fact, as I was saying before, lending is growing, but it conti continues to grow at uh, fairly modest rates. But we certainly are monitoring uh, these, uh, these sort of local realities, and we, we closely look at them. I've uh, said many times that the way to cope with these uh, local uh, situations is to think about macroprudential instruments and certainly not about uh, changing monetary policy course. Then I briefly analyzed the consequence that low rates for a long time might have on banks' profitability and on insurance companies, savers, and pension funds. I briefly discussed the situation of the banks in Europe, which, as you know, is, uh, is being discussed. And uh, the overall picture shows the overall picture shows uh, shows that there aren't many. Now I'm talking about the aggregate, of course. In within this aggregate, we may well have uh, outliers, but uh, the overall picture shows that uh, there isn't. Uh, there has been significant progress as far as solvency is concerned where we see that uh, uh, the capital ratios moved from 9% in 2012 to 13% in 2015. But there are problems of profitability. The rate of return on equity moved from uh, 2.8 to 4.5% over the same horizon. And that's certainly not satisfactory. And uh, briefly said, the low profitability of the banks is caused by low growth, first and foremost, certainly low interest rates. Although, when we look at the first full year, 2015, of negative rates, we see that banks' profitability in the aggregate has actually increased, and the net interest income also, as well, has gone up. But we ought to be aware that within this aggregate, there are many different situations. So some banks are affected more and some less by the low rate situation. And certainly, as time goes on, a considerable adjustment in their business model is needed. A third cause for low profitability, of course, is the high level of non-performing loans. And uh, the, also, if one again looks at uh, these are aggregate numbers. So you, there are many different situations within these, these averages. Uh, if one looks at the average cost-income ratio, is about 53% for the euro area, which is higher than other parts of the world's banking systems. And um, and with and there are there are banking situations where this ratio goes up to 70%. So clearly, change in business model is needed. I briefly discussed the situation of overcapacity. As you know, the ESRB has, uh, has uh, presented a paper on that. But we have to be quite careful on how we define overcapacity. Is this because we have too many banks or too many people? Or profitability is too low with respect to the number of banks? And I concluded saying that basically the monetary policy, the very accommodative monetary policy we are having is necessary for the return to growth and for inflation to go back to our objective. But clearly, it may have side effects. And so the conclusion is that uh, to, on one hand, to maximize the effectiveness of our monetary policy, one needs the complement of other policies, namely structural policies and fiscal policies. But also to minimize the side effects of this monetary policy, the complement of such policies is necessary. And I'll stop here now. I'm at your disposal for a few questions. Alessandro Merli.
guys have to discuss the uh, possible for Brexit. Uh, right after uh, the vote, uh, the uh, reaction of the market was quite negative, but in the past uh, several days or hours, the stock fluctuations of uh, sterling in particular, are there any concerns that this may spread to, uh, to other sectors of the market? And uh, my other question is about you don't, you don't have necessarily asked two questions. Uh, just, we are not in Frankfurt. It's not Frankfurt. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. It's about, it's about fiscal, uh, your constant call for fiscal policy to uh, support the actual monetary policy government structure. Is, um, did you have the feel by talking to your colleagues and government authorities here that uh, are you making any headway with this call or, uh, or not? It's quite important. Now, um, we, we, as far as Brexit is concerned, there wasn't really a, a complete discussion extended to the developments of the last few days. Um, many speakers have noted that um, the short-term effects of uh, the outcome of the UK referendum were less dramatic than people expected. Uh, both as far as financial markets are concerned, but also as far as the real economy is concerned. Does it mean that they, there will be no effect? And the answer is no. We don't know, frankly, what's going to happen in the medium term. The consequences, the, the event is very significant. To think that you won't have any consequence would be probably to hope for too much. But what the exactly this medium-term consequence will be, it's hard to say, because also it will depend on how prolonged will be the uncertainty following the outcome of the referendum, and what's the final shape of the agreement that will be found between the various parties. But certainly it is another of these political uncertainties that clouds the outlook for growth. And um, so that, that was the main, the main uh, observation that several of the participants, and including myself, have made. Um, then you were saying about, oh, about fiscal policy. Uh, I, discussed about, I discussed fiscal policy today uh, and to some extent, and um, made the following points that uh, because th there are th there's also a, a fairly elaborated policy advice by the IMF as far as fiscal policy is concerned so the position of the ECB is the following um, let's start from uh, from the reality from our reality the eurozone reality where we have rules we have the stability and growth pact so if rules are well designed and are respected and are applied consistently through time and across countries and in a transparent fashion, they are beneficial. And they are beneficial for two reasons. Because they enhance the credibility of the governments that apply these rules and enhance, strengthen the trust amongst governments amongst countries that form our union. Which also means the opposite, that if they are not applied consistently or in a transparent way, there will be a loss of credibility and there will be also a loss of trust. Now, trust is especially important for the countries that form the union because any progress towards a deeper union is based on trust. And any progress towards a deeper union is necessary to make our union more resilient to shocks, less vulnerable than it is today. So that's what, uh, that's what, uh, what one of the things I said. And then I try to give some meaning to the sentence that's often said, even 
that basically says that uh, countries that have fiscal space should use it and countries that don't have it should not. Now, if we go a little deeper on that, we see that there are different categories of countries in our union. You have countries that, there's a one group of countries where you have full employment, by and large full employment, a quite significant current account surplus, and average or low debt, public debt. So these are the countries that in theory would have fiscal space. But what sort of policy advice is one where you advise to make a significant fiscal expansion in a country that's at full employment? So here, the scope for a fiscal expansion exists, but it has to be targeted to increase productivity, supply and productivity. That's the right fiscal expansion in these countries, namely targeted, geared to improve education, digitalization, certain special infrastructures which are particularly effective in increasing productivity. Then you have the other countries where, the, which, where, where, where there is high unemployment, either balanced current account or small surpluses, and high debt. And these countries don't have fiscal space. So rather than thinking about how to expand the size of their budget, they should work on the composition of their budgets, making these budgets more growth friendly than they are today. And that means basically lowering current government expenditure and increasing possibly, if there is space, public investment again targeted to high productivity objectives. It means lower taxation, especially lower distortionary taxation, so lower taxes on labor. That is basically, by and large, what, what I said about fiscal policy. Balash Korani? I will just bring your mic, it's easier than to hear. Apologies in advance and for the two questions. One can I actually minute. ask you to ask one question? We're a bit short for time and there's many, many of your colleagues okay, who would I'll like to. So I'll try my best. <laughs> Pick um, it. Please. Inflation in 2019, do you expect uh, to be hitting your target? Um, Mr. Mersch in a speech a few days ago said he wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if you were already at target uh, when the projections come out. Uh, is, is that also your expectation? I'm sorry, exactly what is my expectation? Are you, do you expect to hit your inflation target already in 2019? Our, our current macroeconomic projections foresee that, that our, our inflation rate will pick up during the course of 2017, it's, um, and then will continue moving 2018 towards the objective of an inflation rate which is close but below 2%. That is, but this, as I said before, is predicated on maintaining the extraordinary support of our monetary policy. Thank you. Claire, Claire Jones. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, wa was there any discussion of the Bank of Japan's latest measures, and um, specifically the pledge to target inflation of above? 2% oh. um, and targeting a specific yield on 10-year bonds, and what if not, just more broadly, are these I the sorts of ideas that you or other central banks could could consider? No, there wasn't, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there might have been on the side of different meetings, but there wasn't uh, uh, any explicit discussion of these measures, and as far as we are concerned, we never discussed them, really. Jeff Cutmore. Uh, Mr. President, can I ask you um, a more open question? I wonder if you could just share with us your experience of the IMF World Bank meeting this year and whether in the conversations you've had both about Europe, profitability, investment and growth, you're going to come away more or less optimistic or pessimistic about 2017.
Well, it's, um, I know it's going to be a disappointing answer, but I, I would say neither. Um, in the sense that we see a recovery firming up in Europe, and we see the situation in some emerging markets improving, a situation which had been c continuously deteriorating um, in the last year and a half. At the same time, so that there are there are grounds for optimism on one hand. Uh, on the other, we see that there are significant geopolitical risks ahead. And, uh, and, and, uh, w and, and we agree with the IMF on the point that these risks are on the downside. So, um, as I said, neither. It's, um, if we compare, let's I put it this way, if we compare these meetings with the previous meetings, the situation is better. That's, that's what I can say. Chris Giles? Thank you. In, in relation to your financial stability mandate, um, do you feel that you need the competency to regulate clearing within either the Eurozone or the EU in future, particularly after Britain leaves? Well, this is a matter for uh, for really for legislators, lawmakers to decide. The uh, what I know is that um, it would, uh, we, as you know, we the ECB doesn't have competence over clearing of uh, securities, but it does have competence over payments in euros. So, why it doesn't have competence? Because the directive, the EMIR directive, doesn't give it to the ECB. And our statute as well, if I'm not mistaken, is an article in our statute that doesn't say that. So either the lawmakers amend our statute or and amend the Emmer directive. But it's their hands. It's not up to us to decide. Thank you. Alessandro Speziale. Alessandro Speciale, Bloomberg News. Um, Mr. President, in recent months, um, your calls on governments to deliver on structural reforms have become more intense. Is there a sense that you are um, losing confidence or losing patience in the government's capacity to use the opportunity given by the ECB accommodative monetary policy? No, it's not a matter of losing patience or capacity. That would be presumptuous of me to, to say anything like that. But there's no, there's no doubt that this monetary policy gives time to governments to act. We are convinced that accommodative monetary policies actually are a good incentive to implement reforms. We are not convinced that high interest rates force or or are the right incentives for governments to undertake reforms, we, with few exceptions. I think we've discussed this on other, on other occasions. There are clearly certain reforms linked to the budget that, uh, when, uh, that, that become urgent because markets, there are periods when markets refuse to finance the budgets of some governments, so they are being done. But many other structural reforms, just think about education, the judiciary, are not linked to the level of interest rates, or for this matter, political reforms constitutional reforms are not linked to the level of interest rates. So, in fact, the low level of interest rate for some, in, in some cases, is actually makes these reforms easier. But, uh, but governments know that time is limited, that this, accommo this, mon this is accommodating monetary conditions will not be forever. And uh, this is the sense in which uh, in which uh, the ECB uh, often invites the governments uh, to undertake the reforms. And, uh, and it's quite clear that, uh, that uh, as I said before, it also enhances the effectiveness of our monetary policies, uh, of our monetary policy, <coughs> and, makes the, um, and makes the side effects that our policies might have less significant 
because the as I was saying before the the monetary accommodation w would have to last less long. Last question to the lady in the front here. Stefania Spatti Radio Cor. Is there um, are you concerned about the level of divergence between the ECB's monetary policy and that of the Federal Reserve? In other words, is there a level of divergence that would make central bankers not comfortable? Well, I wouldn't put it this way. We are clearly uh, we are clearly in, on on different paths. Uh, the uh, recovery in uh, in the euro area is uh, is in its early stages. And uh, and uh, our reaching the objective of our inflation rate uh, uh, is also uh, qu quite uh, is, uh, is distant in time, so necessarily our monetary policy is different and the paths are divergent in especially in perspective. But I wouldn't say that uh, there is concern about the, the degree of divergence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.